Today, we are looking at the dyscalculia toolkit. When educators started hearing about dyscalculia, it was often misunderstood. People thought it was like dyslexia, but with numbers. So they assumed that it meant kids just switched around numerals. But that's not what dyscalculia is. On page five of the dyscalculia toolkit, Ronit Bird writes, developmental dyscalculia was first recognized in the UK by the Department of Education and Science in 2001 and defined as a condition that affects the ability to acquire arithmetical skills. Dyscalculic learners may have difficulty understanding simple number concepts, lack an intuitive grasp of numbers, and have problems learning number facts and procedures even if they produce a correct answer or use a correct method, they may do so mechanically and without confidence. Now, I know that may sound like a whole lot of your students, depending upon the day, but the research around dyscalculia is still so new. And in the book, she says that estimates say around four to 6% of the population have dyscalculia which equates to around one child in an average classroom. So to help you a bit more to decide if a struggling kiddo has dyscalculia, later on page five, she lists out these indicators for dyscalculia. An inability to subitize, see without counting, even very small quantities an inability to estimate whether a numerical answer is reasonable, weakness in both short-term and long-term memory, an inability to count backwards reliably, a weakness in visual and spatial orientation, directional, like left, right, confusion, slow processing speeds when engaged in maths activities, trouble with sequencing, a tendency not to notice patterns, a problem with all aspects of money, a market delay in learning to read a clock to tell the time, an inability to manage time in daily life. If you have kiddos who have these indicators, it's worth digging into more to see if you can get testing done to officially diagnose it. In the book, Ronit discusses the type of teaching that dyscalculic learners need. In short, these kiddos need concrete materials and visual models. She goes into detail about it throughout the book, along with the other suggestions on how best to help kiddos with dyscalculia. The book is full of activities and games, so you have lots of practical ideas that you can use as soon as you open the book. If you have a kiddo in your life or in your classroom who has those indicators, I highly suggest you get the book to give you ideas on how to help, even if the child doesn't get an official diagnosis, because all the things mentioned in this book are really just great teaching practices for all our learners. I'll link to the book as well as Ronit's website, which has some free resources over at buildmathminds.com slash 84.